question. My name is Andrew, and thank you for supporting me and my troop 326. Thank you, St. Luke Methodist Church, for supporting Troop 326 and scouting. St. Luke, thank you for supporting Troop 326 and BSA America. Happy Scout Day. Uh, thank you to St. Luke for allowing Troop 326 to be a part of your community, and also thank you for supporting my Eagle Project. Thank you, St. Luke, for supporting Troop 326 and supporting Scouts. My name is Andrew, and thank you for supporting me and my Troop 326. Thank you, St. Luke Methodist Church, for supporting Troop 326 and Scouting. St. Luke, thank you for supporting Troop 326 and BSA America. Happy Scout Day. Uh, thank you to St. Luke for allowing Troop 326 to be a part of your community, and also thank you for supporting my Eagle Project.
Team St. Luke for supporting Troop 326 and supporting Scouts. My name is Andrew, and thank you for supporting me and my Troop 326. Thank you, St. Luke Methodist Church, for supporting Troop 326 and scouting. St. Luke, thank you for supporting Troop 326 and BSA America. Happy Scout Day. Uh, thank you to St. Luke for allowing Troop 326 to be a part of your community, and also thank you for supporting my Eagle Project. Thank you, St. Luke, for supporting Troop 326 and supporting the Scouts. My name is Andrew, and thank you for supporting me and my Troop 326. Thank you, St. Luke Methodist Church, for supporting Troop 326 and Scouting. St. Luke, thank you for supporting Troop 326 and BSA America. Happy Scout Day. Uh, thank you to St. Luke for allowing Troop 326 to be a part of your community, and also thank you for supporting my Eagle Project.
to St. Luke for supporting Troop 326 and supporting the Scouts. My name is Andrew, and thank you for supporting me and my Troop 326. Thank you, St. Luke Methodist Church, for supporting Troop 326 and scouting. St. Luke, thank you for supporting Troop 326 and BSA America. Happy Scout Day. Uh, thank you to St. Luke for allowing Troop 326 to be a part of your community, and also thank you for supporting my Eagle Project. Thank you, St. Luke, for supporting Troop 326 and supporting the Scouts. My name is Andrew, and thank you for supporting me and my Troop 326. Thank you, St. Luke Methodist Church, for supporting Troop 326 and Scouting. St. Luke, thank you for supporting Troop 326 and BSA America. Happy Scout Day. Uh, thank you to St. Luke for allowing Troop 326 to be a part of your community, and also thank you for supporting my Eagle Project.
Nikki St. Luke for supporting Troop 326 and supporting the Scouts. My name is Andrew, and thank you for supporting me and my Troop 326. Thank you, St. Luke Methodist Church, for supporting Troop 326 and scouting. St. Luke, thank you for supporting Troop 326 and BSA America. Happy Scout Day. Uh, thank you to St. Luke for allowing Troop 326 to be a part of your community, and also thank you for supporting my Eagle Project. Hopefully you're staying warm and uh, we are here uh, and we're very happy to have you with us. Uh, a couple things, keep in mind that we do have communion today, so you might get some of that together as we go through the service so you can participate with us. Also, please uh, make a note uh, in the comments of anything you would like to lift up for prayer or anything you'd like to celebrate and share with the rest of the church community. That being said, we will start our service by listening to our prelude.
Let us continue our worship with our opening prayer. O God, whom we call love, you welcome us into this time of worship and remind us that this world, this place, and this moment belong to you. You welcome us as strangers and travelers on a journey we do not always want or understand. You ask that we feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and comfort those who mourn. O oh God, we ask that as we learn and grow and attempt to serve you and others, we will be given the grace to love you and our neighbor in all that we do. We pray that at the end of each day, we can say that those whom love is a stranger will have found in each of us generous friends. Amen. The scripture reading today comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick and pos or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not per permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go to the neighboring town so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, Galilee proclaiming the message of, to their synagogues and casting out demons. Hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. Hey, everyone. Did you hear what I heard in the Bible story today? It basically said that Jesus was a doctor. Okay, well, it didn't say that exactly, but it did say that Jesus was healing people with many kinds of diseases. That's kind of like a doctor, right? You know, I had to go to the doctors a few times in this past year. Maybe you did too. I sure am grateful for the knowledge that doctors and nurses have and the hard work that they do. As bad as things can get with people's health sometimes, if it were not for doctors, well, things might be so much worse. Plus, doctors and nurses and other people help to keep us healthy and safe. And they're the ones that will help us deal with other kinds of diseases like the COVID virus. Hey, I have an idea. Let's talk to a real doctor today. Someone who could give us a few ideas of how we can stay safe. Also, maybe how we could help to be a healer or care for other people in the world. Just like Jesus. So everyone, I want you today to meet Dr. Becky Riley. In addition to being a doctor extraordinaire, she is also a member of St. Luke's Church. And you may have seen her around the church when we were back meeting in person. So welcome to the children's sermon, Dr. Riley. And today we have a couple of questions for you that hopefully you can help us with here. Um, one, Number one is, we know from our scripture reading today that God, Jesus, cares about uh, the health of people. So what can we do to help take care of ourselves? Well, I'm glad you asked, Chris. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. So in the days of COVID, we know that there are several precautions we can take. One is to wear masks. 
And if you're in a situation where you're not wearing a mask, you need to be sure you're at least six feet away from other people. And Chris and I have definitely figured out that we are six feet apart. So that means not going places where there are likely to be big crowds. Wear your mask when you're outside of the house, wash your hands a lot. But there are several other things you can do, whether there's a pandemic or not, to try to stay healthy. A lot of them are things that your parents are already telling you to do. You should eat your vegetables. Fruits and vegetables are very good for you. And slow down on snacks. It's okay to eat things we like. One thing Chris and I have in common is we both like chocolate. And really, it's okay to have some snacks, but that shouldn't be most of what you eat during the day. Another thing you need to do is go outside and play. Stay physically active in the fresh air if you can. And that means not too much screen time. Now, being at school now for a lot of you will involve screen time. But otherwise, watching TV or playing computer games is something, again, you do it in moderation. Studying hard is very good for your brain. Making things is really good for you as well, expressing your creativity some way. And actually, being nice and spending time with friends and family has health benefits as well as just making you feel good. Well, those are great things to consider and a great reminder about fruits and vegetables and uh, getting exercise. So um, thank you, Dr. Riley. Um, so the second question I have is, what kinds of things can we do to help other people to be healthy or to stay safe? And we remember that we're not doctors like you are, but are there things that we can do to help other people sure. be safe and healthy? Sure. Now, I just want to say first, if somebody is really in trouble and looks like they need a doctor, please call 911. But for those examples of times when we all see people who are sad or who are hurt emotionally or physically, there are lots of things we can do to try to be helpful. First is try not to be the one who injures them. Think about what you're doing and what you're going to say before you say it. Sometimes you have to say things that might hurt someone's feelings, that you can do that as kindly as possible. Try to do things that are safe, that are not going to get yourself or other people hurt. But the other thing is just to be with somebody who's hurting. A lot of times when people have someone they love who's sick or who has died, People don't know what to say, and so they just stay away. And you don't have to say anything brilliant. Sometimes being quiet or just saying, I'm sorry you feel bad, is the best you can do. If you can do it safely, giving a hug is a good thing. Just sitting with somebody is a good thing. And one of the things that I find that cheers people up pretty well is snacks. Some, this would be a time when having a little snack with somebody would be a good thing. If there's a way that you can help them with what's wrong, that's great. But if all you can do is be there for them, that is just as important. Hey, Dr. Raleigh, thank you so much. Those are some really great ideas. You're amazing. Thank you. Hey, I have another idea. Let's say thank you to all the doctors and nurses and people who help us, like Dr. Riley, to stay safe. They are truly showing love. And when love is shown, well, that's one of the ways that we can see that God is at work in the world.
Good morning. Our hymn today is, There is a Balm in Gilead. But, you know, while our past hymns have had specific uh, authors of the tunes and the lyrics, and maybe even 300 years ago, this tune really doesn't have any specific creation of a tune uh, or, or the lyrics. Uh, it is an African-American spiritual that was probably created about the mid-1800s. Uh, Gilead, from the Old Testament, Gilead was a, a mountainous area east of the Jordan River, and it was known for its skillful physicians and an ointment that the population felt had, had healing powers. But while this tune refers to an Old Testament area or theme, uh, it really is being applied to the New Testament, where Jesus is really the balm that, uh, that heals, heals people. Uh, when people are seeking comfort and healing and assurance, Jesus is the healing ointment. Let's now hear the hymn. Before we begin this, this sermon time, this time of sharing, let's just take a moment to pray. Stop for a moment and just take a couple of deep breaths with me. You know, the Gospel of Mark is, um, it's a gospel for our time today. You know, we've been in Mark now for what, a chapter? A total of, what, 39 verses. And already in the Gospel of Mark, we have heard the, the word immediate a, a number of times. You know, uh, Jesus immediately gets up out of the water after being baptized and goes into the wilderness. Uh, the disciples immediately get out of the boats and follow Jesus to be disciples. The people, right after, they, right after sunset on Sabbath, when they can get outside and go, they show up at Simon's house. It's as if, it's as if people are just, 
just waiting to go, trying to, trying to do all they can to, to hurry up. Yeah, it, it feels like our time now in some ways. I don't know about you, but it's now been right at a year um, since we began to, to talk about how we as a church would start to respond to COVID. It was, it was about a year ago that we were all talking about, you know, well, maybe, maybe we shouldn't shake hands anymore. You know, we'll, we'll do a fist bump or an, or an elbow bump or just, or just stand apart from each other politely and acknowledge the other. But we're not going to touch one another. Wow, a lot of things have changed. Last year at this time, we wouldn't have imagined that we would allow the things around us to impact the way we lived our lives like we have this past year. The things, the pressures we've had on our lives that have caused us to behave differently are, are different from that in Jesus' time, but the impact is similar. For us, it's been a virus that has forced us to act differently The virus in Jesus' day had nothing to do with biology, had everything to do with politics. The Romans, for years now, have forced the Jews to behave in ways they didn't want to behave. And people, they've had enough. You can sense that they want something to change, and they want it to change now. And they believe in Jesus that they are following someone. That someone has appeared in their their time that is going to make a difference. And that difference can't come soon enough. Jesus has just spent time in the synagogue preaching his, his first sermon. And he has read from Isaiah and said that the time is now fulfilled This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And he's gone, and he's come out, and he's gone to Simon's house. And Simon has told him about his mother-in-law, who has a fever. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, sometimes there are fevers that you can, you know, you're hot and kind of miserable, but you can can get through it. That's not what, that's not what Simon's mother-in-law has. She's got one of those fevers that has put her in bed, and she's not getting up, and, uh, and you get a sense that there's just this, there's this hint of worry about whether or not she's going to make it. And Jesus goes in, and he reaches out, and he takes her hand, and she's raised up, and she is well. Now, a couple of weeks ago when I was preaching, I, I kind of played with, joked about the fact that isn't that the way things work? That once, once mom is well, then she gets up and she begins to do all the things she was doing before and serves everybody around her. You know, and, and I would like to think at times that the gender roles have changed, that it isn't so much now that, that women are the people in the homes that that get up and care for all the rest of the folk that live in the house. And yet, it has probably not changed as much as I would like to think it has changed. I'm not sure that that's exactly what's happening, though, in this story um, with Mark. Because Mark is telling... Uh, He's had a chance to take specific stories and to tell them in specific ways so that they have more meaning than what they just seem to have on first blush reading. We know that Jesus is going to take the rest of the time with the disciples trying to teach them about the kingdom, that the, the community that he is creating. And at the heart of that community is going to be for them to serve others others. In fact, I I looked it up in between. In the Gospel of Mark, we don't have the scene where Jesus takes the towel and washes the feet of the disciples. That's in another one of the Gospels. But, But the story is similar in that even at the end of the story, Jesus is trying to help get the disciples to see that his kingdom 
the community that he is creating isn't about power, about power over those around, but it's about love and it's about service and it's about the way in which those things change, change the way we live with each other and change how we can live with each other. And in the Gospel of Mark, the first one that gets that, the first one that understands that because of their experience with Jesus, because of the way in which they have been healed by Jesus, their lives are now about service, about creating a different community, is Simon's mother-in-law. She becomes that, that first uh, disciple that gets it. And that's a theme that's going to go on through the Gospel of Mark. It Not only is it the women, but it's the demons. They understand who Jesus is better than the ones that Jesus has called to follow him. In a sense, it's, um, it's the men. It's those who are supposedly in a... a in a place of access and privilege that take the longest to understand what's really going on. You know, that isn't so different than how it is with us now. You know, it's those of us who, who ought to understand that sometimes have to come back and visit the story over and over again in order to really understand. And so the story goes on. After Jesus has healed uh, Simon's mother-in-law, then people from all over the, the, the village come. Now, Mark has a way of telling the story to the nth degree. It says everyone came to Simon's house in order to be healed. I, I don't know if anybody took attendance, but we get the sense that it doesn't seem like there's anybody else left in the village. They have come to be healed, and Jesus takes the time to heal them, and he does that all throughout the night, so much so that they, at the end of the night, after everybody goes to bed, Jesus gets up in the dark, and he goes out to pray. Now, there are different ways to hunt for people. You know, there's the kind of hunting we learn how to do when, um, when we're playing hide-and-seek. You know, and we, we look and we try to find, and it's a game, and we want to win. You know, but at the end of the day, if we, don't, if we don't absolutely find them, you know, we can go back to home base and, you know, say everybody's free and, you know, and just start over and play the game again. That's one way to hunt for people. Another way to hunt for people is when you've lost your child in a crowded store. That's when hunting becomes much different. That's that hunting that has reached down into your stomach and grabbed all of those emotions. The fear and the anger and the disappointment and the hopeful and hopelessness that, that you've got to find that other person. It's in that sense that I think that, that Simon has gone out in the, in the morning to find Jesus. He's got to find him. He's got to find him because important things are going to happen, and if he can't find Jesus, they can't be done. It's as if you can almost hear, you can almost hear the echo in Simon's head of, of the talking to that he's going to give Jesus when he finds him because Jesus has forgotten what's important. Jesus has forgotten that people are being healed, that things are changing, that the kingdom, the community of God is going to be now. He's the Messiah, the one they've been waiting for. He's got work to do. And he's taken time out to go someplace and pray. Now, come on, how much praying does he need to do? It's only been, what, a week, maybe? Since he had 40 days in the wilderness, and all he did was spend that time in prayer with God. Does he really need to take more time to pray now when there's so much work to be done?
Yeah. Yeah, he does. He does need to take time to pray because there's so many things to do. Jesus has to take time away so that he can listen. Listen to God, listen to himself, listen to his body, and listen to God again. To take stock of what's happening in his life and in the life of those around him and with the disciples. To just calm himself. And be at peace with himself and with God. Now, I don't know how you pray. I don't know how often you pray. I don't even know why you pray. I have figured out in my life that one of the reasons I don't pray, or I don't pray for this particular reason, is that I don't think God is keeping score. I don't think that there is this this um, cosmic scoreboard in which every time I say a prayer, there gets to be a little mark up there. Or every time I pray for somebody, that they get a little mark by their name. That's not why I pray. I pray because I know before anything that it is in that time of prayer that I change. I don't know if the world around me changes. But I do know that I change. Now, some of you, some of you have learned about process theology over the years and have have been um, uh, liberated and informed by that kind of theology. A theology that doesn't focus on that that God's... um, That the everlasting part of God, the continuing part of God, is not this unchanging nature of God. That God is God and God never changes. That's not what process theology is built around. What process theology is built around is the fact that the unchanging part of God is that God is always changing. That God is always expanding. That our understanding of God and God's impact on the world is always growing and creating. Now, when you think of God that way, then my willingness to participate in prayer and your willingness to participate in prayer, all of us together, that then becomes this give and take, this flow of the divine that creates in the world other possibilities. Now, I'll confess to you that after I read so much process theology, my mind begins to be a little bit overwhelmed. I'm not sure that I understand it all or can even really explain it well. But at the heart of it, what it is saying is that what we do makes a difference. We may not understand exactly how it makes a difference, and it may not be a direct line that if I pray for this, that happens. But my willingness to be a part, my willingness to spiritually put myself out there makes a difference in what is able to be created in the world. How I do that, how I pray, well, there's a lot of different options for that. When I was first growing up, I remember I learned to pray devotionally. I probably learned it at camp. You know, where you, would, where you would set aside some time, the same time every day, and you would, you would go and you'd have a little verse you would read, and, and then you would think about that a bit, and then, and then you would pray about that, uh, and, and maybe then just sit for a moment, and then that was your devotion time. I was never really good at that, because they wanted you to do that the same time every day, and I was never good at the same time every day. But for some folks, that is how they pray, and it works. Good. God love them. That works. Other folk, you know, they have a, a, a prayer list. You know, we have the list. We'll share it here in a while of all the, of many of the different ways um, and people 
that we are praying for uh, as a part of our community. We are reminding ourselves. We are reminding ourselves of, of their particular need at this particular time. And calling to mind that we are all a part of God's community of love. And, and we pray for them. The church over the ages, through the centuries, is actually, they, they have calendars of different things that get prayed for on particular days because it, throughout history, things have happened. That's a way to pray. Some folk journal. Some folk just sit in silence. Others, others try to center themselves in a way that they think about a particular thing the whole time. Others try to not think of anything at all. You know, there are times, frankly, in my life where some of my best prayers have come when I have, I have found a place where there's nobody else around because I'm going to have a prayer out loud with God. And, frankly, in those moments, I have used words in my conversation with, with God that my grandmother would have used soap in my mouth for. Because I got stuff going on that I need to just be real about. And say it out loud and say it just the way I'm feeling it. And it's been in those moments where, where when I would stop and take a breath before continuing, that I knew what I was doing was important and connecting in some way. I don't often pray that way. But when I do, but when I do, it connects me to God in a way that uh, other prayers don't. Now in my life, what I do is I try to take 20 minutes to pray. But I know that if I don't sit and journal for about the first three or four minutes, I write maybe four sentences um, at the beginning of that time. If I don't do that, then the only thing I get done in the next 20 minutes is to go over the list of things that I need to be doing. I have to get that out just a little bit so that I can stop. And then what I try to do is just simply breathe. Deeply, slowly, with focus. Because what I know about myself is that when I get in a hurry and get anxious, I start, my heart starts to beat faster, and I start to breathe faster, and I start to just get carried away. And in fact, if I'm under stress, a lot of stress, or think I'm walking into conflict, what I, what I know about myself is I will start holding my breath. It's stupid, but I do it. And if I just take time to sit and breathe, and breathe all the way out, I'm better able to listen. And at the end of the time, I feel more calm, and I'm much better able to deal with the things that I am facing than before. So why does Jesus take time out of the middle of the night to go away again, to be quiet when there is so much work to be done? Well, because there's so much work to be done that he knows that if he doesn't take a little time now, he'll never have a chance to get it all done. What matters is the balance, the in and the out, the rest and the work, the listening and the doing. I don't pray that well, but that doesn't matter. What matters is if I'm willing to just show up. You may pray wonderfully or not so well either. What really matters is are you willing to take the time and just show up?
It doesn't have to be 20 minutes. It can be two. But show up and be present for the two. Perfection is never the goal. Presence. Presence is what you're after. I don't know about all the things you've got to do this week. I don't know all the challenges that you're going to face. I don't know all the moments when you are going to feel alone. What I do hope and pray for you is that in that moment when that you feel that pressure, you will just stop and breathe and feel the Spirit of God around you. Amen. We come to the point in the service where we have a chance to remember as a community together the good things and the bad things that we face, the joys and the concerns that we share. Chuck? As we lift up uh, some of our joys and concerns, let's keep these things in mind. There was a Note this morning after the children's sermon that uh, we are cherished to have Becky Riley uh, as an active member of uh, St. Luke United Methodist Church. And we extend that out to all the medical professionals that are in our congregation. We have multitude of doctors, nurses, and practitioners that are a part of our congregation and we thank them for their work out in their jobs, in the community, and being a part of our congregation. Also, there was a note that uh, was sent out this morning during the sermon uh, about the fact that we miss seeing one another, greeting one another, shaking each other's hands, uh, and that, that is something that we hope uh, that we all can experience again soon together. Speaking of the breath of God, we want to uh, uh, reach out uh, and keep in mind these individuals that are in our thoughts and then in our prayers, and they have lifted up their names so that we would pray for them. And there's research to support that that helps them. First, Chris Sowers, who is improving on her uh, uh, COVID illness, uh, with new medication, uh, that and her uh, uh, sympathy uh, that we want to reach out uh, and sympathize with her and her family at the death of Jackie Sowers. Also, sympathy for Kirk and Teresa Kellner on the death of Teresa's mother. These people we lift up in our prayers uh, that uh, were in the announcements this week as well. Janae Beavers, uh, Sharon Fisher's sister, um, uh, has lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, and cephas, sepsis uh, as a complication. Mariana Hergenrader, Jerry Kellner, Dean Klein, Carol McCormick, Levon Nye, Carolyn Orr, Bill Peppermeyer, uh, the uh, Hendersons point out, is recovering from heart surgery and a stent surgery, as well as hip replacement surgery. So uh, prayers for Bill. Continued prayers for Lois Podnodnik, K. Smith's son, who had a successful surgery last week but is in recovery. Joanne Young's daughter in ICU with serious infection. Uh, Joanne's sister, uh, Bobby Dougherty, uh, with health concerns. Madeline McRae's uncle, Bill, is in the hospital again with COVID a second time. Harold and Barb House wanted to put Harold's brother uh, into our prayers uh, and his daughter. These people we lift up for prayers and concerns uh, for everyone. Um, we want to uh, uh, point out that uh, 
on the bright side that we are getting plenty of snow right now that will later take care of our drought needs. Uh, and that is true. Uh, we do need this. Farmers need this. Uh, and our area needs this. So thank you for lifting that up as well, Anne. Um, Marshall, that's, that's all I've got for right now. Let's just take some time to pray. Um, let's just take some time to center ourselves. Um, take a deep breath, and when you take a deep breath, breathe it all the way out. Take a deep breath for yourself. Take another deep breath for for those that you love, those gathered around you, and those you call to mind. Take a deep breath for this moment, this moment that never happens again. Gracious God, <clears throat> loving God, God of laughter and imagination, God of comfort in the midst of our sorrow. Our list is long. Our list is long and it's filled with people who grieve, people who are ill, people who've experienced loss, and people who feel like they are about to experience loss. Lord, in the midst of all of that, we're stretched apart. We come to the moments where our, our, our lives and our muscles and our neck, are, they're t it's tight. We don't know how much more we can take. And we hope for and pray for a sense of peace. A sense of being able to allow ourselves to relax into your presence and know that. Know that there is nothing we will really that we will experience that will happen outside of your presence, outside of your love. Lord, and as we deal with all those things, there are still those moments where we have a chance to laugh and to giggle, to see children and grandchildren, to see in the lives of those around us the, that, that spark of being creative, that, that opportunity to be thankful that moment when we see hope. Lord, we pray that we might keep these things in balance. That we might not just look into the corner of our despair, but turn around and see those places where there is hope. Now, Lord, we'll admit, we know. We know that for some reason we turn to that corner we turn to the corner where we only see the difficulties. So Lord, gently grab us, turn us, that we might see your hope and your love. And Lord, as we do, help us to do that with confidence that we know that we will be able to respond this week, as we find the opportunities to live out the things for which we pray, when we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us such this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We're going to take a moment to get ready to have communion. I would invite you, if you haven't gathered the stuff around yourselves that you would like to use uh, to share communion, uh, please do. Remember, it doesn't have to be bread and grape juice. Just something that will remind you of the presence of God in the body and in, in, the, in the grape juice that we drink. Let us take a moment to, to receive this sacrament. Let us remember together that at this table, we give thanks for the wonderful gift of reflective awareness that allows us to recognize and name the presence of the Creator Spirit of God that we find all around us. Everything we have, everything we see, everything we do, everyone we love, and everyone who loves us reveals the sustaining presence of God. We give thanks for Jesus of Nazareth, who loved so greatly and taught so clearly and courageously that he was able to set people free from images and ideas and religious practices that bound them into fear and a false sense of separation from the spirit of life. From him we learn how our loving is a sharing in the life of the spirit of God. In Jesus we see the spirit of life challenging all of us to make the presence of God on earth more visible. We, recommend, we remember the night before he died, when he took bread, gave thanks for everything he had, broke the bread, and shared it with his friends, asking them to remember his total surrender to the spirit of life and love and his enduring love for each of them, we take this bread and eat it, mindful of the Spirit at work in our lives, in the ordinary, in the everyday, and in our desire to love as generously as Jesus loved. Likewise, knowing his life was about to be poured out, Jesus shared a cup of wine with his friends. We drink now mindful of our bonding with Jesus and with all people, through the Spirit at work in our lives. We are grateful for who we are and for each other. We believe that we are blessed and that through this meal we become a blessing to others. May we be truly the body of Christ in all that we do. Amen. As we share communion here, we invite you to partake and share of communion where you are. invite those who are gathered here to help um, record and share the service this morning to come up and take communion. And remember the bread of life and the cup of love.
At this point in time, we'll go over some of our announcements that we have. Uh, some of them you have seen week after week, and we will show those slides, and I'll briefly go through those, and then we'll go on to some that are uh, new and some things that we have to detail. First of all, of course, uh, Children's Sunday School, as well as Mission Kids, is listed in the uh, first two slides. Confirmation and junior high youth met this morning at 90, 945. Right now, the senior high youth is meeting for Sunday school on Zoom. Wednesday night, we'll continue our youth group at 630 with the meal and 7 to 8 o'clock for the program. Uh, fundraiser for teacher support. Of course, we'll continue to take money for that as we reach out to support the teachers as well in their uh, their work as uh, they, they work very hard to try and keep students uh, caught up in this uh, COVID time, which is a struggle for uh, families and the schools. With that, uh, for this month, we are asking youth as well as adults to write thank you notes to the teachers at uh, Crestridge and Columbia uh, so that they will understand how we appreciate their work. Those cards should be turned into the church by the 10th, which is this Wednesday, so we can get those out yet this week to those teachers. Super Bowl party, that is uh, later this afternoon at 515 for youth and young adults. Uh, if you have not yet gotten the details on that, please talk to Chris or contact Chris. Uh, he will be around the office today uh, preparing for that. It's an activity that all the youth and young adults do enjoy. Uh, Ash Wednesday. Yes, we are going to have Ash Wednesday. This, for many people, is a, a significant way to start the Lenten season. Uh, it is the 17th, and what we're going to start off with is we're going to have some youth hold some signs off 120th and get, them, uh, get people who are interested to turn off and come in our south uh, parking lot and we're going to have drive-through Ash Wednesday uh, um, markings uh, for them, uh, and we're going to deliver those ashes. Then also, for the congregation or those who want to meet in person or come at a later time, from 6 to 7, we will have in-person uh, time of delivering the ashes as well as a time for self-contemplation and prayer in the sanctuary. Marshall and I will both be here. If you need us to come out and deliver the ashes to you at the car, we will do so. So that is the 17th. From 5 uh, o'clock for the drive through for those dr passing by, to 6 to 7 for the congregation. Uh, lint in a box for children and families. Uh, there is a packet of information and supporting materials uh, that uh, the church will provide families uh, during this time so that there can be a family activity talking about this Lenten season. Uh, if you're interested, please contact the church office. We'll provide the, that information on the shelves as you enter the bell tower area uh, and get that put together for you uh, so that you can uh, have that conversation and dialogue at home with your family and your children. Uh, book study. We have two weeks left of our, our, uh, 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 our study that we started in January, uh, and um, this study uh, will meet this Wednesday at 10 on the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew, and then also Tuesday the 16th uh, at 7 o'clock. Wednesday again, uh, the 17th is Ash Wednesday, and we will be starting a new study throughout the um, Lint, and we'll give you more detail, details very soon. With that, uh, if there's no other announcements, uh, we'll go ahead and conclude our service by reading our benediction. Just a reminder, uh, we ask that you take a little time to silently meditate as you listen to the postlude that's played after the benediction. Our benediction. Please read with me. Now let us go in peace to serve a faith that matters, to grow in the love of God, and to serve wherever we are led. Amen.